Welcome to the book launch of In Concert, Performing Musical Persona um, by Professor Philip Oslander. We're really happy that you've decided to join us today. My name is Catherine Mancy, and I'm the Public Programming Librarian. So without further ado, I'd like to pass today's event on to my colleague and librarian, Charlie Bennett. Hello, everybody. I am delighted to be introducing Professor Philip Oslander. He is part of the faculty at Georgia Tech in the School of Literature, Media, and Communication, where he has taught courses in drama, performance studies, rock music, film acting, and radio. And I still have my beat up copy of the theater and its double from one of his performance studies uh, classes from I won't tell you how long ago. Professor Oslander's area of research is performance how it relates to music, media, technology, and art. He is a scholar of performance and a performer himself, having acted on stage and in film. His website suggests that you check out his IMDB entry, and I suggest that also. We are delighted to have him presenting with us today, celebrating his most recent publication, In Concert, Performing Musical Persona from the University of Michigan Press, which delves into the way that musicians perform both their music and themselves. Now, that might not be exactly the right summary of it, but we have Professor Oslander here to really delve into it. And I'm delighted to say that this is the second time I'm hearing him talk about his book, because he was on Lost in the Stacks, the Research Library Rock and Roll Radio Show, uh, the most recent episode, which you can check out after this episode also. I will be present, I'll be taking some notes, and I'll be ready to help you all get your questions to him after the presentation. So, without further ado, Professor Oslander, the screen is yours. <laughs> Thank you. And, and thanks to everybody, Catherine, Charlie, everybody at the Georgia Tech Library who helped make this possible. Um, <clears throat> so this book uh, is part of a larger research project that goes back close to 20 years at this point and really came from my interest in bringing together two of the things that I'm most passionate about, one of them being music, primarily as a fan, uh, and the other being performance as both a fan and uh, a performer. And what I discovered in, in terms of my academic life is that people who are interested in theater and performance studies weren't talking about musicians as performers. Uh, and on the other side, musicologists and people like that weren't really doing so either. Um, and so my goal in all of this was to kind of create a dialogue uh, through which people on both sides, those interested in performance and those interested in music, uh, could could find a, a common a common ground uh, on which to discuss musicians as performers. And for me, the first question that really drives this whole thing is if musicians are performers, which clearly they are then what kind of performers are they? Um, and this is where the concept of musical persona that's at the heart of this book comes from. So we probably don't usually think of musicians as engaged in characterization the way we think of actors, but I would also say that it's probably a mistake to just assume that when we see a musician perform, we are simply seeing them being themselves performing music. So, for example, the musicologist Peter Johnson describes the difference between the classical pianist Alfred Brendel's identities on stage and off stage. And he says, the unassuming figure of Alfred Brendel is transformed into the magisterial pianist as his fingers touch the keys, but the man returns as he quietly acknowledges the applause. I'd like to show you just a little bit of Alfred Brendel. 
where he just sits still with his hands still over the keys. And that's the moment of transition. That's where he's moving out of his role as what Johnson calls the magisterial pianist and reassumes his role as Alfred Brendel, the, the human being, who Johnson describes as unassuming as opposed to magisterial. Johnson compares the musician to an actor, but he doesn't suggest that Brendel's persona is to be thought of as a fictional role, such as an actor would play. So the magisterial pianist that he is when he's playing is just as much a real person as the unassuming man that he is when he's not playing. Both are identities Brendel assumes under different circumstances. I use the term musical persona to describe the identity Brendel performs on stage. And I also argue that all musicians portray such persona in one way or another. Michael Jackson dramatized this idea and the process of persona construction and routine he would perform frequently in concert before launching into the song Billie Jean. And I'd like to share that with you now. got to spend a little time watching Michael Jackson dance. So in this routine, Jackson dressed in a billowy white t-shirt, athletic pants, and I think tap shoes, walks on stage, sometimes meanderingly, sometimes purposefully, carrying an old valise. After placing the valise on a high stool, he opens it and starts removing items from it, beginning with a sequin black shirt, which he puts on, followed by a single sequin white glove, which he wriggles onto his hand. Finally, he removes from the valise a black Fred Astaire style fedora. He adjusts the brim, dusts it off, walks around with it, but doesn't put it on his head until he has walked across the stage to a microphone on a stand in a single spotlight. The moment when he puts his hat on his head, strikes the pose that begins the Billie Jean choreography, is the moment when his transformation from Michael Jackson, the human being, into Michael Jackson, the musical persona, is complete and the concert could begin. So what I love about this is that Michael Jackson shows you the construction of his musical persona. He, you know, he demonstrates, he does it in front of you, right? He comes on stage in a very different guise. He doesn't even move like the way he walks. He doesn't even move like Michael Jackson, right? And then he sort of transforms himself into Michael Jackson through these elements of costume uh, and a progressive change in how he holds himself and how he moves until by the time he's in the spotlight and puts the hat on his head, he's fully transformed into Michael Jackson, the musical persona. Uh, 
I have identified three layers of performance in which musicians engage. The real person, that is the performer as a human being, the performance persona, the version of the performance we see on stage, and I've given you two examples of that, Alfred, uh, Brendel and Michael Jackson, and the character. In the clip I just played, we see Michael Jackson transform himself from his identity as Michael Jackson, the human being, into Michael Jackson, the persona. Once he starts singing Billie Jean, he also becomes a character who is speaking through the song's lyrics. Of these three layers, musical persona is the most important one since it's the interface between the performer and the audience. The persona is also an identity that musicians generally perform whenever they are publicly visible on stage or off stage. For example, the Beatles perform their identities as charming, boyish, and mischievous in press conferences and interviews as much as they did in their concerts. Admittedly, the line between persona and character is not always clear. Ziggy Stardust was both a character in some of David Bowie's songs and the persona he assumed while performing those and other songs, creating complexity and ambiguity. It is also true that the line between real person and the musical persona is not always clear. So the line between persona and character is not always clear, and the line between real person and persona is not always clear, especially in musical contexts such as the singer-songwriter genre of the 1970s, as exemplified by James Taylor and Joni Mitchell, where there is a desire to believe that the person we see on stage is identical with the artist as a private person, and that the songs are in some measure autobiographical or confessional. All of this notwithstanding, the vocabulary of real person, musical persona, and song character provides a way of describing and analyzing multiple elements of performed musical identities and their interrelationships in both clear-cut and more ambiguous cases. Now, one of the key points for me is that musical persona has a direct relationship to musical genre. I mean, so, I mean, this, this much is obvious, right? Rock musicians simply do not look or act like classical musicians who do not look or act like jazz musicians, and so on. And even within genres, there are distinctions. So psychedelic rockers do not look and act like glam rockers who do not look and act like punk rockers, etc. Musical genres and subgenres define the most basic and important sets of conventions and expectations within which music, musicians and their audiences function. Genres can and do overlap, and musicians draw on genres other than their own in their performances. So, for example, uh, Mick Jagger, who of course is a rocker, uh, is said to have derived much of his movement style from Tina Turner, a soul artist. Genre conventions change over time and never have the force of absolute rules. Nevertheless, they are crucially important to performers in constructing their performance personae to audiences in interpreting and responding to them and to both in creating and maintaining a sense of musical identity and community. So I argue that at any point in time, there's a normative persona for a given musical genre that serves as a point of reference for the musicians who perform in that genre, which can be different from the normative persona for the same genre at a different point in time. So, for example, in the 1920s, the archetypal persona on which most country music performers based their individual persona was the hillbilly. In fact, country music was called hillbilly music at this time, and this slide is of uh, an early group uh, called the hillbillies. Between 1935 and 1940, the model for the country music persona transformed gradually from the hillbilly to the cowboy, due in large part to Gene Autry's popularity as a singing cowboy in Hollywood films, an image taken up by country artists ready to move away from the hillbilly image to something more dignified and respectable. The existence of a normative persona does not mean that all musicians necessarily have to adhere to it. They may choose to adopt it or resist it or critique it or challenge it or change it through their own performances, as did Roy Acuff, a key figure in country music in the 1930s and 40s, when he refused to portray a cowboy saying, there is nothing cowboy about me. To illustrate further what I mean by a normative persona, we can look at the singer-songwriter genre I mentioned a moment ago. As Ken Tucker describes it, quote, the music produced by such artists as James Taylor, Joni Mitchell, and Carole King was intimate, confessional, and personal music with precise, semi-autobiographical lyrics and moderate amplification, end quote. The normative persona for this genre at this time revealed the connection between the singer-songwriter 
and the second wave urban folk mu music movement that had preceded it by a decade as represented in the early 1960s by figures such as Joan Baez and Bob Dylan. The BBC television program In Concert frequently presented live studio performances by singer-songwriters in the early 1970s, providing good material from which to develop a sense of the genre's normative persona. In keeping with the intimate and personal affect of the music, the program was produced in a club-like setting with a relatively small, seated audience that remained very quiet and intently focused on the performers, applauding at the ends of songs or at the start of well-known numbers to express recognition. Based on observations made from watching concert performances by James Taylor, Neil Young, Bill Withers, Gordon Lightfoot, Joni Mitchell, and Carole King, all on this same BBC program, I offer the following generalizations concerning the normative persona in the singer-songwriter genre. In terms of appearance, the singer-songwriter is informally but neatly addressed, a bit more toward the preppy side than the hippie side. Even Neil Young wears a brown sports jacket on the program. Perhaps coincidentally, both Joni Mitchell and Carole King wear feminine pink floor-length dresses. For the most part, the singer-songwriter appears as a single seated figure playing an acoustic instrument. Gordon Lightfoot and Joni Mitchell both actually stand up when they're playing, so they're partial exception. When other musicians are present, sometimes playing electric instruments, as is the case for Carol King, Gordon Lightfoot, and Bill Withers, they remain discreetly to the side, even in semi-darkness, to keep the focus on the individual figure sharing his or her personal thoughts. In no way are we invited to perceive the figures gathered on stage as musical groups or bands, they are clearly presented as solo artists with backup. The singer-songwriter is generally modest and self-effacing in manner. It's a genre characterized by low theatricality in performance. Most of these performers play their songs while looking down or with closed eyes. Mitchell occasionally casts a sidelong glance at her audience. They barely move, although Carole King, who's a bit more ardent in her performance style than the others, does bounce on her piano bench. They tend to lean into their vocal microphones as if whispering in a listener's ear. Taylor does not look at his audience even when they are applauding him, though he does face them when speaking between songs. The, the tone of stage talk in the singer-songwriter genre is conversational and friendly. The talk itself consists largely of what ethnomusicologist John Beale calls song formulations, designed to guide the listener's understanding of the songs through statements about their meanings and the circumstances of their composition. Although these musicians were certainly not compelled to perform in a certain way, a remarkable unity of presentation emerges from looking at enough such performances to be able to identify a normative persona for this genre. Even though I emphasize the normative dimensions of persona in relation to genre, I am not suggesting that musical personae are necessarily rigid or static, though they can be. There is a continuum from types of musical performance in which the musician's personae are strongly mandated because they are built into the conventions of a particular genre, so symphony players or members of marching bands would be examples, to types in which musicians have a great deal of freedom to construct their personae. This is a little cartoon that appeared in the New York Times a number of years ago that sort of shows you the, the rules governing the appearance of uh, classical musicians, uh, which are different for the regular season, the summer season in the park, matinee performances, and evening performances. So this is a case in which the musicians have no freedom in terms of their presentation, at least visual presentation. Um, of course, you know, if you're thinking about rock or something like that, the musicians have much greater freedom. But in no case is the musician in a position to construct a persona entirely autonomously. Personae are always negotiated between musicians and their audiences within the constraints of genre. Performers in any genre of music may find, for example, that audiences expect them to continue to do some version of what they seemingly have always done. When and how quickly a performer's persona may evolve, if at all, and in what directions, are subject to delicate negotiations with the audience. Miscalculation can result in anything from a temporary setback to the end of a performing career though the performer's only alternative often is to freeze a popular persona in the hope of retaining the loyalty of its original audience. This can also come about unintentionally. So for example, some people have said that uh, control over David Bowie's persona, uh, the Ziggy Stardust persona, was subsumed by the audience and the market. He became so identified with Ziggy Stardust 
that he became a prisoner of the image he himself had created. But some musical performers find ways of letting their persona change successfully over time. Compare the Beatles in 1963, when they were essentially a very talented boy band, with the Beatles in 1968, this is actually 67, when they were recognized as countercultural avatars. I mentioned earlier, as I mentioned earlier, during the era of Beatlemania in the mid 1960s, the Beatles had a collective identity of a cheerful, user friendly, slightly irreverent boy band. Each Beatle had his own individual persona, but all of their personae had to harmonize with this group affect. By 1967, however, the Beatles group persona had morphed into that of a psychedelic rock band plugged into the countercultural ethos of the time. At both moments, each individual Beatles persona was articulated to the group persona, whereas in the mid-1960s, bands dubbed Paul McCartney the cute Beatle, John Lennon the smart Beatle, George Harrison the quiet Beatle, and Ringo Starr the funny Beatle, their individual identities shifted in, relations to the, in relation to the group's overall persona. In Richard Avedon's canonical portrait photographs of 1967, originally published in Look magazine in the United States and other magazines in the United Kingdom and Europe, then disseminated widely as posters, Ringo is shown with a dove in his hand, suggesting his commitment to the peace and love dimension of the counterculture, a persona he maintains to this day, while John Lennon is presented with spirals for eyes, perhaps indicating his engagement with psychedelia and the drug culture. Paul appears as a flower child in pastel blues, surrounded by blooms, and the portrait of George emphasizes his mysticism. A parallel development in another musical realm might be the career of John Coltrane, who emerged as a highly respected, hardworking post-bop tenor saxophonist in the 1950s, but later transformed himself into a spiritual seeker exploring the psyche and the cosmos through demanding dissonant music. In both his case and that of the Beatles, the changes of persona were dramatic, yet there was an audience prepared to accept the performers in each guise. I would also say, though, thinking about these two cases, that the transformation went much more smoothly for the Beatles than for John Coltrane, uh, because the music that he was making in this, in this latter phase was so difficult and so dissonant that a lot of the people and critics who had admired him previous to that uh, were, were very uh, displeased. The Beach Boys, by contrast, attempted the same transformation as the Beatles, from teen heartthrobs to countercultural eminences, but were unable to achieve credibility within the counterculture in the second half of the 1960s. It wasn't until the early 1970s that the Beach Boys achieved credibility with the hippie audience. They did this by using the strategy of authenticity by association. In 1971, the Beach Boys shared a bill with the Grateful Dead at the Fillmore East in New York City, and the two groups performed together on stage. Thereafter, the Beach Boys would mention their association with the dead to their audiences whenever possible, finally giving them an in with an audience they had cultivated unsuccessfully for a number of years. In the book, I explore many other dimensions of musical persona in genre contexts that include rock, pop, jazz, laptop and electronic music, blues, and country. I discuss the importance of visual information to musical experience, particularly musicians' gestures and facial expressions, questions that arise when musicians perform in more than one genre, the audience's role in creating musical personae, instrumentalists' relationships to their instruments, and many other things. I present case studies and examples of musicians ranging from Miles Davis, Keith Urban, Darius Rucker, Glenn Gould, and Jefferson Airplane, to Laurie Anderson, B.B. King, Lady Gaga, and Nicki Minaj. At this point, though, I'd like to end this formal presentation in favor of dialogue with you. So, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Uh, I have a bunch of questions for you, but I'd like to remind the audience first, you may go to the Q&A bar in your, uh, your interface and start putting in questions. I'll be the, uh, the mediating force for those questions, but uh, I would love to see stuff that you all want to talk about. So, Professor, my first question uh, it is about the audience and authenticity. There seems to be an almost uh, warning to us as audience members for musical acts to not believe in authenticity as just a 
single force, but to understand that we are influencing the musicians and the musicians are uh, telling us what they want to tell us. Can you talk about authenticity and maybe how your idea of it uh, changed as you moved through the research for the book? Well, yeah, I mean, author, especially in popular music, although certainly not exclusively, because there are lots of discussions around authenticity in classical music also, which are a bit, a little bit different, I think, in tone than the ones in popular music. But certainly in popular music, authenticity is, is a, a huge topic. Um, my basic take on it is that going back again to my emphasis on genre context, that what matters is the way in which authenticity, what counts as authentic within any given genre context, right? And the idea that uh, audiences uh, will, will buy into a persona as authentic if enough of the genre uh, conventions for authenticity are observed, even if it's clear that something inauthentic in a different sense is going on. So, for example, in the book, I talk about Keith Urban, right? Now, traditionally, authentic country music identity means that you are American, that you're from the South, from a working class background, and so on. But we all know that there are many country musicians, including some very famous ones, who don't have that kind of background, right? And Keith Urban is a good example of that, since he's originally from New Zealand and grew up in Australia. But, of course, you know, as a country music artist, he assumes all of the trappings, you know, he wears the cowboy hat, he, you know, et cetera. Um, and when he sings, he sings in an American accent, right? So he sounds like a country singer, an American accent with a sort of Southern twang to it. Um, and so, you know, what's interesting about that is that his, his willingness to do that, to, to observe the conventions of, of country music authenticity, makes him authentic in the eyes of his audience. That he, gets, he gets the audience to buy into that. Um, and so I think, I think for me, that's what authenticity is. It's ultimately an agreement between the audience and the performer that if you present yourself in certain ways, you know, we will, we will buy that. We will accept that as, as an authentic persona within this context. And of course, what counts as authentic you know, from one genre context to another, um, is very different, right? Um, so, you know, the kind of, very low-key presentation that's necessary in the context of the singer-songwriter genre that I was talking about um, is totally different from what counts as authentic within glam rock, uh, a, a genre about which I wrote an earlier book, um, where everything is very theatrical, very overstated, very over the top, right? Um, so a glam rock persona would not count as authentic in the context of singer-songwriter, and the singer-songwriter persona would not count as authentic in the context of glam rock. Um, and so, so it's all what, what, what counts as authentic is, is contextual, right? It's context uh, specific. Uh, and it ultimately does have to do with a, a transaction between the performer and how they choose to present themselves within that context and the audience. Uh, I see that we're getting some questions in the uh, the Q&A bar. I have a follow-up before we get to those, though. Um, okay. Normative, you, you talked about the genre sort of normative personae. Um, are, those, are those conceptual or are they very superficial? You were talking about, you know, sort of the movements that the, uh, the singer-songwriters were engaged in, you know, looking down. Um, but does it, does it become more of a, uh, your, the particular musician's version of a larger concept, or is it very much in their sort of actions and outfit on the day of performance? I'm not entirely sure I understand the distinction. Um, <laughs> I, I can try again. Uh, do you feel like the normative qualities of these musical personas, can they be reduced to more sort of um, uh, concepts that can be uh, sort of explained separate from the musicians, or is it very much about how the audience is seeing each individual musician at the moment of their performance? Well, I guess given that choice, I would say the latter, right? That it's that the persona always arises from the interaction between the performer um, and the audience. 
I mean, I think if I understand what you're asking correctly, which I may not be, um, I th you know, there's sort of an interesting question as to how a normative persona comes into being, right? Um, I mean, how it is that there's such great consistency uh, yeah. in self-presentation across the members of a genre. And I, you know, I think that's a, that's a complicated question. It also goes back to the other equally complicated question of how musical genres come into being, right? Um, and I think that's the kind of question that in some ways has to be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, because, I mean, for example, studying glam rock, for instance, Glam rock is in a lot of ways a very inorganic genre. I mean, it was basically created by two people, <laughs> um, David Bowie and Mark Bolan of T-Rex um, in the very early 1970s in England. Um, and then, you know, it kind of snowballed from there. I mean, the good news is that it's quite easy to construct the narrative of how glam rock came into being. Um, but at the same time, it's it's not as if there was some you know, musical community or other kind of community from which it gave rise. It really was uh, the work of, of these two people uh, who were seeking an alternative uh, coming out of the late 1960s to psychedelia and psychedelic rock and trying to move things in a different direction. Um, and, and so they, in somewhat in tandem, started to experiment in certain ways, and then that snowballed over the course of the first half of the 1970s to other artists who kind of, you know, took up aspects of this and Etc. So that's a case where the the genre itself and the kind of persona associated with it, um, and to a certain extent in glam rock, the genre is really defined by those persona more than anything else. Um, that's a case where you know it's 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 as I said, it's sort of inorganic. It, it's it's really the inv the specific invention of a couple of people. Whereas I don't think probably the singer songwriter genre evolved in anything like that way. Um, I think it, it came much more out of sort of a community of like-minded musicians who had one foot in the folk movement or, uh, you know, folk music of an earlier time, um, et cetera. So I, I really not sure that that kind of question can be answered uh, as a generalization. I think you probably really need to look at particular cases and see how these evolutions uh, play out. Well, I think that's a much more thoughtful answer than my question was, so I appreciate that. Let's go into the uh, the Q and A, the audience Q and A. Uh, do you see having a persona that can be carried throughout the performer's career as something that can give them more longevity? Well, yes and no. <laughs> I mean, again, it does kind of it does kind of depend on the case, right? So, okay, let's talk about the Beatles. If the Beatles had maintained the same group and individual persona you know, that they enacted from 1963 through 66, if they had kept doing that after 66, their career would not have been, would not have lasted. They would not have had longevity, right? Because those personae were fine for the early 60s. They were sort of in touch with certain aspects uh, of uh, Anglo-American culture, if not to say global culture. But, you know, after 1966 or around 1966, that really ceased to be the case. I mean, there, there is this kind of irony in the Beatles' career that in 1966, when they were still doing concerts, they were still presenting themselves and playing the kind of music that they had been playing in 1964 and 5. Meanwhile, the records they were making were moving in totally different musical directions, you know, much more experimental ones. So there was this really sharp distinction between what they were doing in the studio as musicians uh, in terms of you know innovating new new sounds and ideas and what they were doing on stage, which was still what they had been doing on stage in 1962 or three, essentially, right? But in terms of persona, if they had insisted on maintaining those early 60s persona into persona into the uh, late 60s, that you know that, that would that would have uh, that would have been their demise because those persona and that idea of what a group is was simply not in touch with the cultural changes that had occurred in the second half of the 1960s, right? So, yeah, that would be an example where maintaining that original persona would not have been a good strategy uh, in terms of career longevity. Whereas, you know, for other art, for some other artists, uh, it probably is. Bruce Springsteen is probably a good example. Mm -hmm. uh, perform a very consistent kind of persona from you know the moment that he first started to become famous and he's maintained it ever since. And it is a key element to his longevity as an artist. 
So again, I'm sorry to keep saying this, but it's kind of case by case. You're right. You know? No, that's great. Um, we have another question uh, which talks about Motown artists. I'm um, hoping that you would have in the book um, artists like the Supremes who were always clearly presenting a black respectability persona. Mm -hmm. What do you think of this genre of performance that so clearly connects to social status pressures, et cetera? Uh, I'm not, <laughs> what do I think of it? Well, I mean, what I think is that, I, actually, I appreciate the question because what I think is, it's sort of related to what I was just saying, that, you know, the development or evolution of musical persona does not occur in a vacuum, right? It occurs in the context of larger social uh, pressures and larger social movements. Um, I actually have a chart in the book, which is one, one of the, my sort of earliest sketchings of, of what I was trying to figure out, um, in which the, the, the musical performance has frames around it, right? And the outermost frame is that frame of, of the social, of what's going on in, in the larger world, uh, of which the musical performance is a part and to which it always inevitably um, has a relationship. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't have, uh, you know, I'm not going to say that I think what happened to Motown was good or bad or whatever, but I would say that, you know, the sort of aspirational persona that those artists presented you know, was, was not happening in a vacuum, right? It, it, was, it was related in a particular way uh, to larger social uh, issues of the time um, and, and a particular perspective uh, on those issues. Unfortunately, I do not really talk about Motown in the book, I'm sorry to say. All right, uh, another question. I'm interested in challenging or transgressive performers and the persona they use to confront the audience. I've seen it most in rock music, but certainly jazz musicians have a history of presenting incredibly challenging discordant music, as you mentioned with John Coltrane. Uh, can you speak on the phenomenon of the transgressive or uh, I guess really just aggressive musical persona <laughs> and uh, their effect on the audience? Ah, the effect on the audience. Well, yeah, that's interesting. And and actually, I would say probably two different things, uh, contrasting rock and jazz in this case, because I've actually been doing some some looking into the, the jazz phenomenon that, that you describe, uh, which is this kind of overt antagonism on the part of musicians, particularly like, say, Charles Mingus. Um, I mean, he's the he's the best example of that. And then there's another, you know, not so much antagonism as indifference. So, for example, Bill Evans, the the pianist, if you if you watch performances by uh, the Bill Evans trio, uh, I mean, all three of them, they act as if basically as if the audience isn't isn't present at all. They don't acknowledge the the, the audience in any way. Uh, I mean, at the at the end of a, of a of a piece, when the audience applauds, Bill Evans will sort of turn his head about this much, and that's it. That's the degree of, of acknowledgement of audience that, that he will provide. Um, and Miles Davis was, was, was sort of some, maybe somewhere in between the two in terms of indifference and aggression. Um, there is research, I, not my research, but I've been reading it, that basically uh, associates that particular form of aggression with a deep distrust of the audience um, and a feeling that the audience fundamentally does not understand what we as artists are trying to do, okay? And that's the relationship to audience that's constructed uh, through that. I don't think it's necessarily the same in rock though, because I think that, I don't think it's necessarily the case that very aggressive rock musicians, I'm sorry, you know, Alice Cooper comes to mind, uh, who is somebody I have written about. Um, obviously he's sort of a starting point for a, a lot of other things, um, but, um, I don't think that he necessarily, or artists who engage in that kind of aggression, uh, necessarily are doing so in the belief that uh, their audience fundamentally doesn't understand what they're trying to do, right? Yeah. It may be, in fact, just the opposite. Um, and likewise, on the audience side, uh, you, know, you know, to me, a lot of what I'm talking about has to do, as I've said before, with a kind of, a kind of buy-in, right? So it's sort of, well, of course, can't talk about Alice Cooper like this anymore because he's, he's too old. But, you know, if you went to see Alice Cooper in 1970 and he didn't spit at you, 
you know, or Johnny Rotten, right? I mean, if they suddenly were nice and engaging, you'd be very disappointed as a fan or as an audience member because that's that's the persona, that's what you expect to see when you see that that uh, that performer. So I think there are potentially two different things going on. Um, you know, one in which sort of opposites, really, one in which the aggressive performance um, up to a certain point. I mean, I think that's the difference between aggressive and transgressive, right? I mean, aggressive may be expected of a certain yeah. kind of performer or certain performers, but if, if, if things go far enough, then it becomes transgressive, although exactly where that line is crossed is a little hard to say. Um, but at least it's just in terms of, of talking about aggression, that in the case of, of rock, aggressive rock musicians, I think that's kind of expected of them, right? I mean, that's sort of, that's sort of the norm, in a sense, for yeah. a partic particular subgenres of rock. Whereas in jazz, it does seem to be fairly solid evidence that the musicians felt, just felt that, that the, you know, the audience was coming to see them for the wrong reasons. It was the wrong audience. They didn't really trust them. They didn't really think they knew what, uh, what was going on. Um, which is a whole different uh, situation, clearly. Yeah. I find that very interesting, that um, idea of the sort of expected aggression leading up to a line that then becomes transgression. For instance, if someone were going to go see uh, Gigi Allen, who's now dead, but mm -hmm. when he was performing, if someone went to see Gigi Allen, if he did not throw his own feces at the crowd and, and attack them and, and was, you know, this sort of horrific figure that was uh, the expectation broken. Uh, David Yao of the Jesus Lizard would often get naked and leap into the crowd, and that was sort of expected. And so the line of transgression kind of moves around based on the persona and based on just sort of the, the actions that have preceded those performances. It's, it's very interesting to me. I'm gonna have to delve into that on my own a little bit. Um, another question from the audience. What are your thoughts about the at-home performances and the uh, persona or performer, per persona and performers we have seen since last March? Well, I, I mean, I've seen some of that. Um, I can't say that I've you know, fully immersed myself in it. I do think that, I, I think what's, you know, on the one hand, any any kind of performance, whether it's at home or on a on a stage, whether it's, you know, on a YouTube or, 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 you know, live with an audience present. I mean, any of those kinds of situations uh, provides a good opportunity for the presentation of persona. Um, you know, and presumably, for the most part, musicians are, are simply going to try to do things that are fairly consistent and sort of as we've been, what we've been talking about with what their audiences uh, expect from them. Um, that said, I do think that um, the at-home performance uh, at least in some cases, um, not all. I mean, at home means a lot of different things in these things. So I've seen a bunch of these things that were at home, but were done in the musician's home studio, right? right. To, surrounded by equipment and microphones, you know, et cetera, which is still really a professional context. Um, uh, on the other hand, there's this wonderful video, I don't know if it's still around, of, of Steve Winwood uh, in his cottage somewhere banging away at an upright piano uh, <laughs> with his back to the camera. Uh, which gives you much more of a sense of oh I'm 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 getting a glimpse into this person's real life. We're getting a glimpse of you know what I call the real person in my my, my three part uh, division of the performer. Um, I think to a large extent that's I don't want to say illusory, but it's staged as you know inevitably. Um, but I do think that at least uh, potentially. Um, you know, we, we, we may be allowed to feel, or we may come to feel that we're, you know, we're getting more of a glimpse of uh, the person behind the persona than, uh, than in, in, most, in most concert situations, most performance situations. Again, I, I, wouldn't be, I, I wouldn't be the one to say that that's what's really happening, uh, but it may have sort of an affect of that. I think that goes hand in hand with um, the use of, of some, some performers have made of social media also which has kind of the same effect of giving us the sense that we can get closer to those people or communicate with them more directly uh, than in the past uh, uh, through social media. Uh, and certain people like Lady Gaga, for example, have been very masterful in their use of social media as a way of engaging their audience. Uh, 
Uh, again, I'm I'm not sure that we're really getting closer to the real person, uh, but it may it may produce the the feeling that you're making me think of um, the the rise of the YouTube musical star, people who had never been stage performers but were performing to the screen, and they were sort of separate from the music industry. And now the music industry is starting to adapt to YouTube performance, sort of using what has been built already this idea that you can perform at home you know with with a background like this and it is still a uh, useful authentic or vibrant performance uh yeah yeah if, no, if you have a thought about that please go ahead well i talk about a little bit about some of that in in one chapter in the book i mean it's 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 you know from <laughs> It's not not completely up to date, but I mean, for a while, Justin Bieber was sort of the poster boy for that, right? Uh, because he was a YouTube artist before he became the you know the phenomenon that we know today. Uh, but what interested me about it was precisely that um, it did require the the gatekeepers and mechanism of the existing music industry to get him past being a YouTube artist to being you know a kind of megastar. Right. Uh, he wasn't going to get that whole way uh, simply by showing up on YouTube. So. So, yeah, I, I think there is a, a way in which I mean, obviously, people can have you know, sort of a successful career of sorts just performing on YouTube. That seems to be the case. Um, but in terms of kind of uh, advancing past that, uh, it seems as if the traditional mechanisms of the music industry are still required. So in that sense, YouTube becomes, you know, talent development area. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, so from the audience, uh, do you address opera singers in the book? I do not. <laughs> do you want to uh, uh, talk more about why you left out opera? Or is there was there a distinction between musical theater and performers who were performing personas? Well, I mean, for, yes, because for me, um, well, for me, musical theater and opera are essentially more or less traditional dramatic forms, mm -hmm. right, in, in which the, the singers are portraying characters. Now, of course, it's true, and I do mention this very, very briefly in the book. It is true that, you know, particularly famous opera singers um, do become, do have personae. I mean, if you know, if you think about uh, the most, the best known opera singers, uh, you know, there's a particular image or, or persona that we do associate with them. So I wouldn't say that that doesn't happen. And I think that, I think that that's probably a phenomenon that's similar to, and all of these things are related to one another in terms of performance. I'm not saying that they're totally different uh, at all, but it's probably more re closely related to, for example, film acting where you know we have we have this idea i mean fame a lot of famous film actors uh i always think of you know someone like al pacino in this context have have a certain persona or jack nicholson right there's this entity called al pacino or jack nicholson um which which is always present in their performances and has certain uh, you know identifiable characteristics you know as a presence in addition to the characters that they're playing and i think opera singers are are sort of similar in that regard, um, um, but for me, the the thing that's interesting about musicians, you know, in the in the larger sense, I'm not saying opera singers are not musicians, of course, um, is that um, you know this idea of persona extends beyond singers, right? Yeah. I mean, my argument is that not that all musicians all performing musicians whether they sing or not portray a persona so if the symphony players string quartets you know all of these people um portray a specific musical identity that is a, a meaningful within the context of a particular kind of performance that they're doing um so it's not you know it's not just about singers and what happens then when you're thinking about instrumentalists is that element of character which is present, you know, when someone sings, uh, it's, whether it's opera, musical theater, or someone singing on a concert stage, uh, isn't present, uh, but persona still is. Uh, and that's where my interest lies in particular. Um, I will say uh, one thing, this is a very specific thing, I just want to say it. Um, one thing that 
one question that has come to me is sort of through thinking about all this, which does have to do with singers of all kinds, um, really has to do with the phenomenology of singing, about which I'm very curious, by which I mean essentially, you know, singers refer to their voices as their instruments, which of course makes total sense. But I wonder about the relationship of the singer to that instrument. Is it similar to, you know, someone who's playing an instrument that's separate from their own body? Uh, do singers experience their voices as part of themselves or so, sort of external to themselves or both or what? So I think there's some interesting things to think about there, but that's a point beyond the question of persona. Um, so we're getting to the end, and I have two questions just drop in. Um, so I might have to ask you to be short and succinct on the answers to these big questions. Yeah. Uh, first one, what about the performance of change, meaning – Musical persona can change their performances over time, and a performance can significantly significantly change a musical persona. Do you deal with these aspects in your book? So if I get this right, um, do you talk about how the persona uh, in sort of concert with the audience is changed by performances over time? Uh, no, that's actually a really interesting question of sort of tracing what I would probably think are sort of incremental trace, uh, incremental changes uh, yeah. in a persona. Because a, a wholesale change of persona, which I did talk about with respect to the Beatles, right, early 60s, yeah. late 60s, I mean, that, that was not incremental. Um, and, and so that's one kind of case. But, yeah, that's, I, ha I, hadn't, I haven't dealt with that, but that's an interesting thought um, to kind of look at this over a longer period of time. Um, and see how persona doesn't necessarily change radically in that way, but may nevertheless change, uh, yeah, somehow in concert with the audience. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. Uh, yeah. I will give that some thought. Thank you. That, that feels like a really deep dive question. Like you could do a whole book on what happened in Los Angeles from 68 to 75, you know. Well, yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, and for a last question, you mentioned the normative persona for country music and how many artists subsume their personal history for the good of their career. Uh, I see this having a huge effect in hip hop and rap where the normative persona might have a negative effect on the artist. Can you speak on that? Uh, I'm not sure I understand what is meant by negative effect there. If uh, someone has their sort of actual personality, which uh, conflicts with the performed sort of larger than life criminal personality or larger than life you know heroic personality that might diminish their their career well it might it might but that's why i mentioned keith urban i mean and it would be interesting to try to figure out what the differences are because you know there there are many things about keith urban and other country artists that from one point of view would disqualify them to be country artists yet they have managed to negotiate those issues with their audience to the degree that the audience is willing to essentially overlook those things because the artist is willing to perform the appropriate persona. I think that has happened in hip hop, but it's also not happened in hip hop where certain artists, you know, when people examine their backgrounds, they say, hey, wait a minute, you know, the, you're, not, you're not the right kind of person to be doing this. And that can be damaging. So the question is, what does it take <laughs> for someone who in a sense doesn't have the appropriate credentials to be performing uh, a, a given persona uh, to get the audience to buy into it anyway, because that does happen. But the opposite also happens. And so the question is, what are, what are the factors that make the difference? What does it take to get that audience buy-in in the face of, you know, uh, of uh, discrediting uh, evidence? Well, this has been a great conversation, and I really appreciate all the stuff that now I have to go research on my own. Thank you so much for your time, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to everybody. My pleasure. I want to bring Catherine back to finish off the event. And thank you, everyone who was here to listen and to ask questions. Thank you so much, Charlie. And thank you, Professor Oslander. This was a great event. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined us today. Um, I dropped in the chat the link to the Georgia Tech Library events and workshops. The Georgia Tech Library is committed to providing accessible scholarly programming to our local and our global community. So thank you so for so much. Thank you so much for joining us today.
Um, and if you signed up on the Eventbrite, we'll send out the recording of today's program so you can watch it again at a later date or send it to any friends or family. Thank you for joining us and have a good day.